Okay, great. Um, welcome. Um, thanks to all of you for uh, showing up for tonight's lecture. Uh, as you know from the announcement, this is our 11th annual uh, John L. Aram Lecture in Business Ethics. Um, and we're very, very excited to have Mr. Scott Morris here to uh, give the lecture. Um, I've wanted him to give this lecture actually for a while, for a number of years. Um, but we ended up in a kind of quid pro quo situation um, this year. I was asked to uh, give a presentation um, down in California in San Diego to a gathering of folks from the energy uh, industries. And so as part of the uh, agreement to do that, I got Scott to agree to come this year. And give the well, Brian's pretty good at uh, marketing and closing some yeah, sales, yeah, yeah, so yeah. he's pretty good yeah, at that. He's so. sort of a captive audience at the time, so I'm really glad he's here. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. Those of you who are here from Professor Kerpus's marketing class, um, I don't know if there's a sign-up sheet going around, but there is one in that back corner um, near the uh, secret studio vault back there. So if you need to sign in for that so that she knows you attended, uh, please do that, okay? Um, we are scheduled to be in here from 6 until 8, but I don't know that we'll be here all the way till 8 o'clock. That's an awful long time. <laughs> and Folks start getting fidgety. I could make you stay till late. You know, I, just uh, I don't want to give you that goal. <laughs> give you that goal. Um, so we will we'll try to finish up, say, around 7.30, a little bit after that, something like that. So if you will, I know you'll start getting fidgety, and, and students especially, uh, you know, you got big plans because it's Wednesday, right? And Wednesday is your Friday or something like that. So if you'll please just kind of hang around um, through the Q&A, um, that would be uh, much uh, appreciated. Um, there are a couple of uh, uh, thank yous I want to extend real quickly, and I'm only doing two. I'm notorious for doing a lot of thank yous, but only two this time. Uh, first, I want to extend a um, thank you to the Dean of the School of Business, Dr. Ken Anderson, who's up there in the back. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. As a lot of you know, this is Ethics Week here at the School of Business. Um, I haven't done the research to check this out, but I doubt that there are other schools of businesses around, at least not many, that do a whole Ethics Week. You know, they might do an Ethics Day or an Ethics Lunch or an Ethics 15 Minutes or something like that. But uh, it's rare, but I think it's a mark of the um, um, mission of the um, School of Business here at Gonzaga and of Dr. Anderson's leadership longtime supporter of this Ethics Week, so thank you very much for that. Uh, another thank you uh, goes out to uh, A.J. Hawk, who's in the back, who is our Marketing and Special Events Coordinator. Did I get that correct? Yeah, good enough. Um, she's responsible, really, for putting this whole show on and all the great events that the School of Business uh, hosts. Uh, we couldn't do it without you, A.J. Uh, you know that. But anyways, join me in thanking her for her help. Okay. Um, one announcement before I sort of talk a little bit about the lecture series itself. Um, tomorrow we have our second event in uh, Ethics Week. It's our annual ethics panel put on by Professor Lighthouser, who I'm going to let tell you a little bit about that. So tomorrow in the same room, uh, we will have a panel that we're hosting on the gender wage gap. Most of us know uh, some of the numbers that, that white women on average make uh, 82 cents to the dollar of a white male. Um, it gets much worse when we talk about women of color, uh, and we haven't made a lot of progress over the last 50 years. It's been pretty slow. In fact, uh, it will take, at our current pace, it will take until 2059 for white women to make the same as, my, as white men. Uh, Hispanic women would have to wait until 2224, uh, and African-American women till 2,119. So that seems like a long time. So uh, we're going to see if we can do a little something about that. The panel tomorrow is called uh, How Ethical Leaders Can Close the Wage Gap. We'll have five uh, women professionals who will be here uh, joining us to give us some actual solutions for, for this issue. So please join us tomorrow. Okay, and, and that's going to be a great event. Um, how, we've done these for four or five years now, the panel, um, and they really are a nice way of sort of ending and rounding off uh, Ethics Week. So I invite you to attend that as well. 
So this lecture series is named in honor of Mr. John L. Aram, who had a long and distinguished career in the Northwest timber industry. He worked for Weyerhaeuser primarily, but a number of other uh, companies along the way. Uh, one of the things he was noted for and was quite outspoken about was the need for ethics in business. Um, and he meant not just in how businesses relate to one another, but how firms and organizations are organized internally. Um, so he was noted for that. Uh, when he retired in 1988, uh, a number of companies and some other benefactors created an endowment. Um, which is the endowment today um, funds uh, the professorship that I hold. Uh, we hosted our first Aram professor back in 1992. It's actually the first year I was here. Uh, and some of my students know I told them about it was Thomas Donaldson, who was one of the founding fathers of business ethics. And they were like, oh, it's Thomas Donaldson. I get to meet Thomas Donaldson and all of that. So we've had a, a, a long line of distinguished folks to fill this position. I'm very honored to be the current occupant, and hopefully for a little while longer, uh, of the Aram Chair. Uh, I hope the work that I do, both in the classroom, uh, in the community, and hosting um, this lecture series, uh, does his memory um, honor. So. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about our Aram lecture. Um, he is a GU alum, a double alum, right? I am. Yeah, double alum. I'll let him say more about that when uh, he takes over the floor. Uh, he's been at Avista for almost 40 years, right? Um, serving as president from 2006 until 2018, and a CEO from 2008 until October of this year. So recently retired. Congratulations on that. Yeah. Yeah. See, there you go. When, when you're a utility seat, you don't, you're not used to people clapping. So this is this is good stuff. This is great. Uh, throughout his time with the Vista, he's known for the spirit of service that he's brought to the work, putting the well-being of uh, Vista employees and the communities they serve first and foremost in his leadership. His legacy will be sustained through the Avista Foundation. Uh, as, the, as that foundation continues to support those communities that Avista services uh, and provide services for by funding nonprofits who are working those communities to provide uh, vital support services. Scott has also given generously of his time to the larger Spokane community, having served on the boards of Greater Spokane Incorporated, Edison Electric Institute, Washington Roundtable, and McKinstry. Uh, Scott also, in addition to being alum, has a longtime connection to the university. He was elected to our Board of Trustees in 2004 and is currently in his fourth term. He served as chair of the board from December 2015 to December 2018. Did I get that right? He did. And just on a personal note, um, that overlapped with my tenure as faculty president here at GU. And I have to thank Scott. He was um, invaluable, um, a good mentor in a way, um, as I worked to get my sea legs underneath me as faculty president, part of which meant working with the trustees. So thank you for that help uh, along the way. Scott and his wife, Liz, who is here as well, have been passionate supporters of GU's educational mission for a long time. In recognition of that commitment, Avista has donated $100,000 to GU on behalf of Scott and Liz. That endowment will fund two $2,500 annual scholarships that will be awarded to students majoring in the liberal arts beginning in 2020. As new Avista CEO Dennis Vermillion has noted, quote, Scott and Liz's passion for education runs as deep as their support of Gonzaga University. This scholarship will have a lasting impact for generations of students for decades to come. In fact, Scott's commitment to higher education reaches beyond Gonzaga. He was also instrumental in bringing two, not just one, medical schools to Spokane. As a result, his influence in strengthening higher education extends well beyond the energy sector to include healthcare and now liberal arts through financial scholarships. And as some of our students probably know, that nice little fireplace lounge that we have over in Hemmingson, which is always crowded. Every time I go over there, I can't even get one of the rocking chairs. I really want to sit in one of the rocking chairs. It is owed to the generosity of Scott and Liz, and we thank them for that. So without further ado, Brown, join me in welcoming our 2019 Aram Lecturer in Business Ethics, Mr. Scott Morris. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. I am a Zag. I graduated. I'm in 1980, and no, 
I graduated in 1980. Liz and I, I met my beautiful wife Liz as uh, sophomores in college here. And back in 1977, the drinking age in Idaho was 19. So occasionally we would drive over there. And the romantic story with my wife Liz is we met at the Slab Inn. <laughs> and it was history from there. So there you go. You can meet your, your future wife at a, at, a, at a cowboy bar, and it can work out for you. Forty years later, we're still happily married, and we, we passionately love each other. And so hey, I want to talk. I'm excited about this talk. And I want to talk about clean, green energy. But I want to do it in the context of climate change. And what I want to try to do, because really green energy and clean energy is really synonymous with climate change. When you talk about green energy and clean energy, you really, people automatic transition to kind of human-made climate change. And climate change has really been a fascinating subject as a person who is somebody that has to provide you safe, reliable electricity every single day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And how do you do it cleanly, affordably, reliably? And if you think about, I think about what's been going on with the debate around climate change. When it really started back in the late 90s, early 2000s, the easy thing to do was the fight about the science. And there was the science believers and the science disbelievers. And for more than a decade, when, I'm in the, when we're in the industry and we hear about it, that's what people really focused on. Was the science accurate? And hasn't it been fascinating, I think, in the last five years to see how it's transitioned? Because there's enough qualitative data. You know, I don't know the science. I, I, I've never read anything specifically about human caused, I haven't read the studies. But we all can see what's going on out there, whether it's every day it seems like we see more and more of the ice caps falling off in Antarctica about the size of Rhode Island fall off into the ocean. We read all the time about how in, in the Arctic it's starting to melt and it's getting down to the tundra. There was just recently some news about how Greenland has completely thawed out You've seen lots of, lots of things around, um, of course, uh, fires. How many people are from Northern California? Anybody's family lived through getting their power shut off last week because of the fires and what you've lived through, not just with the fire this, but what's happened because of the fires. And you can argue whether or not it's forest management, but there's something that's drying out the woods. There's so many anecdotal qualitative things that right now, people don't really talk about the science anymore. When people talk about it, it's almost becoming, and I think it is for, I don't want to talk about too many generational things, but I think for millennials and for Generation Z particularly, it's transitioning into a social justice issue. And it's easy for me to stand here as a 61-year-old person, and I'm passionate about it, but in 25 years or 30 years, if I got enough in me, hopefully I make it that long, most of you aren't even going to be my age in 30 years. You're going to be living with this. And when I get into these conversations with people, at this point, it's more like, I don't really care about the science, I just want you to fix it. Get off, get off the argument about the science and just fix it. So what I want to do today is talk about how we at Avista are going about trying to fix it. It's complex. It's more, it's more than science. It's more than economics. This is truly a challenging issue if you really care about reliability, you really care about affordability, you really care about re renewable energy. And what I'm, my, I haven't asked for you as students tonight. I want you to be CEO of Avista. And I'm going to share with you all sorts of stuff that I see. And you, you get to decide at the end of the night, what would you do? I mean, I know what I'm doing, what we're trying to do, but I'm going to share data with you. Some of it, you might say, well, why are you sharing that? Why are you not sharing that? I'm just giving you the information I have. I'm not putting value judgments on it. So if I share something with you and you go, well, well, well wait a minute. I'm just sharing the information with you. And I really am challenging you to say, OK, step back. You're running the company. You have to care about this thing. What would you do? What would you do? So that's, that's my premise for you. So let's get started. So 
Uh, Vista is a 130-year-old company that's been providing electricity that amount of time. So here I am, a young, uh, old guy now. So I was born in 1958, and I grew up my in the, into the 1960s. You know, from the time I was until I got to junior high school. So this electric grid has been a part of our life for 100, about 130 years. We started, and Thomas Edison kind of built it. And amazingly enough, this electric grid is kind of how it was when Edison discovered it and built it out and how we all use it. It's an amazing kind of thing. And did you know that the American Association of Engineers said the most important machine, machine built in the 20th century was the electric grid. Machine, electric grid, generation facilities, got to make it, then you got to put it on some wires somehow, and then I got to get it to distribution, then I got to get it to your house, and somehow I've got to figure out how to play with the science and the physics of the electrons to get them there, and I've got to lower the voltage and play with amps and ohms and blah, 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 blah. It's not an easy thing to do. There's a lot of physics that go with that. So this amazing machine that now all of you take for granted. When you wake up in the morning and you have charged your device, you've done what you've done, I probably don't get a shout out, go a vista. You, you dudes rock, man. You probably have my picture up and saying, thank God for Scott Morris, I charged my iPhone today. <laughs> no, you don't think about it. We know that when it comes to electricity, it is so common that we know we've done studies where unless you get your utility bill or your power goes out, you think about your utility less than one minute a year. No kidding. No kid. So when I grew up in the 60s, in my house on the north side of Spokane, little house, about 1,000 square feet, and we were like most houses, we had about 10 plugged in devices. We had a washer and a dryer, a stove and an oven, a refrigerator, one, oops, one TV set, one TV set that had three channels, an iron, We didn't have air conditioning. We didn't have a dishwasher back then. So when the lights went out, it sucked. But 10 devices, 11 devices, lights, that's about it in the 60s. Today, the average house has how many plugged-in devices do you think? More than 40. Everybody's got an iPad, iPhone, computer, three or four TVs, the boxes that go with them, video games. Every kitchen device in the world is electricity. My God. So reliability, you always, reliability is kind of a throwaway term. Reliability means a lot, especially if you, grew, if you were in Northern California just last week and we, they turned your lights off. So reliability is important, but it is for you as, as homeowners and residential people, but think about commerce. Any, any of you guys carry money around with you anymore? Most of you have your card. And when the lights go out, how do you pay for anything? You don't. How do businesses handle it? They don't. How do you get your work done? You don't because your computer's down. Industry, business, commercial, enterprise is so digitized. The world is so electrified that the world stops when you don't got it. It literally stops. I've been in meetings because of cybersecurity where the federal government said the most important infrastructure we have in the United States is the electric grid and what is you utilities doing to protect it? Because if that goes down, it's gonna suck. So you guys got this handled, please. So that is the context of green, clean energy. What it really means is this. A lot of times when you see clean energy, you see the reliability piece. So reliability really does matter. And also really matters from a, there's energy, but then it, there's, I gotta tell you one physics thing that you gotta keep in your head the whole night. The load has to match the resource. Can't argue about that. It's like gravity. You drop an apple, hits the floor. 
If the load and the resource don't match, the lights go out or the equipment burns out. And it has, to, it has to do that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every minute of every day. It has to, or it doesn't work. The machine doesn't work. And, it, and then you could say, well, if, what if I had a battery in my house? Doesn't matter. The battery better support the load because the battery becomes the resource. And right now, there's not a battery that you can put in your house that can support everything that you got going. If you got a battery, I can keep, you can keep some of your lights on. You can maybe you run your refrigerator, but you can't do 50 things. Trust me, you can't. It's not there yet. I wish, that's one, that's one of the first things that people would say, well, you're a climate hater or you don't believe in this. No, I do, and I, I hope to God that batteries come to fruition. But right now, there isn't one. At a, le at, a, at a level that can, that's affordable that can do that. And there certainly isn't one at a grid level, at my level, where I'm generating electricity for big distribution systems. No such thing as batteries right now to do that. Affordable. Affordable. Social justice. Should everybody have access to electricity? Should you be able to pay for it whether you're rich or poor? Should you be able to use it no matter what? And I've got to be able to provide safe, clean, reliable, green energy in a way that people can pay for it. Well, let's say, well, I'd rather have a battery or I'd rather do something off-grid. Let's use solar panels as an example in California. There's a lot of solar panels on homes in California. You see a lot of solar panels on lower income homes? You see a lot of people buying Tesla battery power walls? No, it's an affordability issue. So as a person that supplies electricity, that has to be of top of mind. It doesn't mean that we don't raise electric rates, we have to, because we have to do all of this stuff. It's a challenging issue to balance the need to invest in your infrastructure to provide what we want to do from an energy perspective, but keep it affordable. We've been able to peg our rate increases about inflation for a decade, about 1.9% on average. You might say that's too high. You might say that's too low. I just peg, let's try to just kind of vector it in on inflation, then let's make these investments we can and let's hit it. But again, you're the CEO. I'm just saying, you, you, you play with this in your, your mind. And finally, renewable, renewable. So renewable to many people mean wind and solar. What if I change that word and said clean? Because as we get into this conversation about what to do for climate change, definitions matter. So you might say, if I'm going to solve climate change and I want clean energy, it has to be renewable. Can't have any carbon. What if I said, that somebody's going to invent something that's going to capture carbon, carbon dioxide, carbon capture, so that when you burn the fossil fuel, they can actually grab it and get rid of it and turn it into something else so it doesn't go in the atmosphere. So does that count in your mind? Would you want your policymakers to have that count or not? Again, clean energy and renewable energy for some people, are two different things. So you have to make that decision. I have to make that decision. We have to make that decision in the context of reliability and affordability. Nobody does has carbon capture figured out yet, so it's kind of like a battery. It's kind of out there. But my sense is somebody, they're going to try to do it. So that's another one. Another, another thing on renewable, let's talk about nuclear. We all know nuclear power emits no carbon dioxide. So in that green box, would you count nuclear or not? What if they invented small nuclear power generating plants that were safe that didn't emit carbon? If you're the CEO, does that count? Does that count for policymakers? Do you go advocate to policymakers that that should count? 
again, so when we get into this conversation, definitions matter, points of view matter, but it has to be done again in this big context of affordable, reliable, re what's renewable. Loads and resources have to match. You don't, get to, you don't get to change the physics. Safe and reliable matters. Affordability matters. It isn't just the science. So every company has mission, vision, values, but what I want to, so I'll talk a little bit about that, but I want to put it in this context. When we talk about our company, and I laughed about this, I, I get to laugh about some things, when I saw Jamie Dimon come out and talk about, in the, the business roundtable about uh, six months ago, talk about stakeholder value. Stakeholder value. You maybe heard about that, that there's more life for businesses than shareholder value. There's stakeholder value. I don't know if you saw that. And what I'm very proud of is that our company, for 20 years, we have passionately driven our company to stakeholder value, what we call our four legs of the stool. I have Lorene here. And if you walked into our building, I promise you, if you said four legs of the stool, people would know what you're talking about. They wouldn't know this stuff. They'd know four legs of the stool. And our four legs of the stool, our company here is this, is that all four legs have to be absolutely in balance. We operate at our best when we are, we are absolutely in balance. Customers, we absolutely have to be passionate about our customers, our employees, I'm tired of companies saying their employees are their greatest resource and then they don't treat them properly. Not just in pay and benefits, but culture, values, opportunities. And if you come to work at Avista, it's a great place to work and I can prove that quantitatively as well as qualitatively. In community, we have a unique responsibility to our communities that we serve. Our employees give over 50,000 hours of of time back to their community in, 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 in service hours, and we give employees work time to do that sometimes, because we put our money where our mouth is. And shareholders, yes. We're an investor-owned utility. So I need to be able to pay my banks and the people that invest in my company their return. But what we talk about from a shareholder perspective is that in a regulated utility company, I'm allowed to earn a 9.5% return on equity. And by God, we better deliver that to our customers because that's what they are, shareholders, because that's what they invested in. We're not trying to make 12. We're not trying to make 15. I'm not trying to make 8. Because I'm not going to be a CEO very long if I make 8 consistently. It's just how it works, man. You make nine and a half. You're in the band. That's a fair return. And that's built into the rates. So from that perspective, four legs of the stool, stakeholder value, then we talk about mission, our values of trust, innovation, and collaboration. Safe, responsible, affordable. You see those words again. From the context of four legs of the stool, that doesn't, that's not meaningful unless you have the four legs of the stool kind of sitting over the top of it. We're not a big utility, three billion market cap, 40,000 square miles, we've got a lot of area. You can see where we serve, Washington, Idaho, Oregon, Alaska, 1,700 employees. So I just wanted to make sure the people that are from Spokane know kind of who we are, what we are, 130 year old company. Great place to work. You know, you always hear about technology is always transforming everything. But for utilities, it, we're kind of late to the party on, in one aspect, and that, that aspect has been the distribution system. We automated the generation system many years ago so you could operate the dams remotely and you could see what's happening or the, or the generation facility. We, offer, we, we, we digitized the transmission lines, those big metal structures you see with the big lines, so that nationally and regionally, we can see where all that power is going. Got it. But what we haven't done as an industry is digitize that distribution system when you walk outside and you see all those old ratty poles and the transformers and all this stuff. So we're starting to put fiber and sensors. And we can actually now see stuff on our distribution system in real time in ways that we've never been able to see before. 
So why is that important? Because what you're going to find out from my perspective on as we talk about climate change and electricity, it isn't just about wind and solar. There's no magic bullet to how you're going to solve this. And we need to be able to use technology on the distribution system to figure out other things that we can do to help drive down greenhouse gas emissions, how we operate our system, be able to use that trans that distribution system becomes one of the most powerful communication systems around that we can put sensors and other things on there so that if you want to measure particulate levels in downtown Spokane with traffic, you can put sensors on our distribution system and we can tell you right now how much pollution is going on in, in town. So our grid isn't doing it, but our smart grid is doing that. And it can help everybody figure out maybe congestion points or what makes sense for public transportation. And the list goes on and on about technology, about how that will help, again, be part of the solution to all of this. There isn't a magic bullet. It isn't that simple. But technology will help us on the distribution side, on a number, also from an energy efficiency perspective, which I'll get into. <coughs> so let's start talking about the generation piece of this, and, and let's start with clean, green energy to start with. So sustainability, let's start with that. Okay, busy chart. What this shows is every electric utility in, in the United States and how much carbon they produce when they generate electricity. So you have, this is the biggest polluters from a carbon perspective all the way to the cleanest. This is where we are, one of the cleanest in the country. Not perfect, but we're pretty good. Here's Idaho Power if you're from Boise. Here's Puget Sound Energy if you're from Seattle. Here's Portland General. I didn't have them there. Here's Portland General if you're from Portland. An interesting one who's got us beat. Where are they? Exelon, right here. Almost no emissions. Exelon's one of the five largest utilities in North America. They serve Chicago, Northeast. Some of the biggest population centers in North America are on Exelon system. Why are they so low? They have the largest nuclear fleet in the country. Again, you decide, not me. But they are here, already pretty much completely carbon neutral. You can see it doesn't really matter if you're an investor-owned utility or you're a government-owned utility. The biggest polluters, you can see the, here, cooperatives and public. So these are nonprofit, publicly-owned utilities. Kind of the first seven or eight are all public utilities, government-owned. Here's some investor-owned utilities. So it, it all just sort of sprinkles in. So our goal here is to try to get this to here. And you know, we used to get really hung up on, you can't do it. It's going to be too expensive. Because we have, it's really hard to figure it out how to get to zero. So you would get frozen in time and you would fight about it. So we finally just decided, what we said is, you know what, stop it. What we're just going to do is, we know we got to get there, let's just put this thing in chunks. We, we, we uh, our, our clean energy mix right now is about 60% Renewable. Hydro's 51. Biomass and wind is another 6 is 57. I'm cheating because we have another wind project that we're going to put online in about 18 months, which will get us to 60. This coal is going to go away by 2025. It will be filled in with renewables. Some of this gas is going to go away. So in a short amount of time, the way we chunked it was, hey, Let's get this thing to 80, and we'll worry about the other 20%, but let's not get ourselves wrapped around the axle that we can't get there by some date. Do what you can do. Do the right thing, and then worry about it. And then let's problem solve our way out of this. Maybe technology will save us. Maybe somebody's going to invent that battery, that carbon, that carbon thing. Maybe they're not. So we've got a number of initiatives out there that we're not banking on that. But if it happens, cool. But if it's not, what are we doing to get ourselves there? 
So I'll show you some of the things that we're doing to try to put ourselves in that position. Here's a normal, this is the gen United States generation mix. Look at the difference. Roughly 60% is fossil fuel. The, you know, the, the wind and hydro and biomass and solar make up about, what's that, 18%? So the country has a long way to go. We're blessed because we have hydroelectric power in the Pacific Northwest. I wish I could say it's because of my dynamic, visionary leadership. <laughs> it just sometimes you get dealt great cards. And we have great hydro, but we take really good care of it. And we do the right thing with it. And we've we, we, we nurture that really well. So the rest of the country's got a real challenge. So how do you, if you're in the Midwest and you don't have any hydro dams, you got a pollution portfolio like that, how are you going to get rid of all that? And how are you going to put in enough windmills and solar panels to get rid of it? And still meet the reliability and the affordability criteria, if you believe that's important. You might not. You might say, this thing is so important from a social justice perspective, I don't care. But that's part of what you have to start. You're the president. You're the CEO. You're running this thing. You don't get to, you don't get to sit on the sidelines tonight. You're in. You're in the game. You got to decide. One of the things that can be frustrating if you're, if you're in, in leadership of a company is when public policy starts dictating how you run your company. And it used to be bothersome because you could say, wow, these elected officials don't understand loads and resources like apples and, you know, they don't get the physics. They don't get any of it. They just come up with these crazy goals and tell us to meet them. And they don't think about affordability or reliability. And if we bring up reliability, that's, they're, they're saying, you're talking code that you're a climate, uh, uh, you don't believe in this stuff. If you, bring up, if you bring up affordability, you're talking code that you're trying to kill it. We're not. We're not. But what else, what we also, what I've discovered and did is just, you know what, I don't really, I have to respect what our policy elected officials are doing. Because I have to change in my mind that this isn't a science fight. This is a social justice fight. There's people saying, I don't care how you fix it, just fix it. So as a company, I have to get over it. That doesn't mean I don't educate. That doesn't mean I don't say, hey, this is some of the consequences. But I'm not going to worry about what Governor Inslee decides to do or governor whoever decides to do. I'm going to do what I need to do to get myself to, to here. I don't care what the policymaker says. This is where we're heading. How fast can I do it? How affordable can I do it? How reliably can I do it? And that's what the organization has to focus on. Get off the, get off the woe is me train that our elected officials don't get it and get on the figure it out train. So our clean energy goals, which we know we can do, we can have a carbon neutral supply of energy by the end of 2027. What does that mean? We're going to be able to put in, you know, we're at 60% now of just green energy. We know we're going to add some more in the next five or six or seven years. And then what we can do is we can buy carbon offsets. There's places you can go to make investments. So as we put carbon into the air, we can buy or fix something else that takes it out. So by 2027, we're going to make sure that, 80, or that we're going to, our entire 100% supply of energy is going to be carbon neutral. So that's not 100% clean, but that's carbon neutral. So, but we know we're not done because, OK, I'm buying offsets, but are we really solving the climate change issue? We are, but we have more work to do. So. Governor Inslee came out with a goal of 100% clean by 2045. Okay. Okay. But I'm going to show you how it's going to be hard to do, given current technology. I'm not saying we're not going to try. But this is part of the choices thing I want you to see. And you get to kind of think about it from your perspective about what you would do.
One thing I wanted to put, you know, we are very environmentally conscious because of our hydro dams. We were the first utility in the country that hired uh, uh, um, uh, environmental engineers and wildlife biologists to work at our company in the 50s. We have a whole fleet of environmental folks because of our hydro dams, because of the commitment we need to make to water, land use, cultural resources. We, we take very good care of the environment. We do that. But I also want you to, from your perspective, I put this here because I think it's going to change, too. You guys have all read that perhaps windmills kill birds. The more windmills I have, I got to figure that out. I don't have to figure it out now because we only have two big wind projects going on our third. But that's going to become an issue. I don't know what's going to happen when you take over so much land with with solar panels and you just cover the ground up, maybe nothing. I'm assuming something. So I know that we're going to have to stay in the game from an environmental perspective. And the other part of this is, it's not my fight, but I think it's something that you hear, and I don't know the data, but it's a data point that you need to consider, is they say that when you build windmills and solar panels, that the carbon it takes to build them is greater than the savings you're making from the actual resource generated. I don't know if that's true, but that's what they say to, to, to engineer and to actually manufacture this stuff is carbon intensive. And is, it, is there something happening upstream to all of this that's environmentally unfriendly? I don't know, but I think it's something that's going to continue to evolve in the conversation. It might not. But for me, as the CEO, it's got to be on my radar screen. I probably I don't know if I can do anything about it, but you might expect me to do something about it as your energy provider, because you might not give me a free pass on that. We have wood waste, too. We're really proud of that. We're the first company in the United States to use wood waste as part of a generation facility up in Petal Falls. Electric vehicles. Let me talk a little bit about this. You know, one of the things about climate change and clean energy is people kind of think if you green up the grid, we're all done. Did you know that for the state of Washington, the electric generation grid makes up 19% of the carbon that goes into the atmosphere. 42% of the carbon that goes into the atmosphere in the state of Washington is vehicles, is transportation. So I can do this all I want, but talk about getting close to home with all of us with our cars. I drove here. We all, we all love the freedom. It's great. But it's sort of the don't talk about it kind of carbon thing because it's just really hard. It impacts my life. I can't go hiking in my car if I don't have my car. I mean, it's sort of a crazy thing. So there's a lot of other things. I mean, we're doing our thing on the grid, but it's not even going to, it's going to move the dial, but it ain't going to fix it. Transportation worldwide is probably the number one thing around carbon. It has to be addressed. And then, OK, buy an electric car. How cool for me. But think about what I just said about reliability 24-7. Just think about how important reliability is going to be if your car is on my grid. And you can't go anywhere if I don't have 24-7 loads and resources matches, and now your lights go out, or it's intermittent, and you can't get in your car because I suck on how I provide your electricity. So talk about society putting their, all their eggs in one basket, the electrical basket. So when you get into these conversations and you talk about intermittent power or affordability, and then you start adding transportation into this, it's a real conversation. And don't let anybody tell you it ain't. If people had electric cars in Northern California when the lights went out last week and they couldn't drive them, I bet they were not happy campers. 
So, again, I just want to put that there for you from a reminder basis. You got to do all three. At least as today, since you're the Avista CEO, you got to do all three. And you got to figure it out where you're going to land in this and what's important and what you pay for and what you don't pay for and how you do it. So what we've done is we've built the largest community solar project in the state of Washington that's in the valley. We've built the largest solar array in the state of Washington in Lynn, Washington. We just put up, we just announced another large wind project. Fortunately for us, those, all those projects are cost effective from a rates perspective. They all didn't add rate pressure. We were able to add that generation under the cost of our cost of generation. The main reason why right now the price has really come down, but there are still federal tax credits to developers that help offset some of this stuff. So I can bring in a wind project under the embedded cost of the generation so that you're not seeing it in your rates. But if those go away, that might not be the case. So as I start to plan more of this, we need to think about whether or not that's going to be there and what's the, what's the rate impact, if, we, if it is or isn't. And it, the price is really going down, so there might not be one. It's, it's great. It's great to see solar and wind is really coming back into it. But that's some of the trade-off that you've got to start thinking about is if these tax credits go away, is how fast, how hard do you go? Knowing what else you've got to do about all the other capital you've got to put into the, the grid to keep it resilient to make sure it's safe and reliable. <coughs> so my point to this being you expect reliability. You expect reliability just because you need it. You don't think about me, which is good, but I hope I've made the point to you that from a societal perspective, both residentially, commercially, and industrially, the country, the world has gone all in on electricity. And you can't compromise reliability in this conversation of renewables. You simply can't do that. One of the things that we, 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 what we have to do is that we built the grid to meet peak load, which means the hottest day of the year, the coldest day of the year. So there's a lot of flexibility on the grid where it's sitting kind of the machines got lots of open highways to do stuff on. So there's things that we can do to maximize the value around that. And we're looking at that. But it, there's also a thing around wind in, that I want to show you around renewables. Because you always hear this, and this is another thing that I get in trouble about. When I say, well, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, people will say, well, that's the utility guy CEO talking code that he really doesn't want to do. And it really isn't true. What it means is I'm thinking about 24-7 reliability, and I understand the physics where I don't get to compromise loads and resources, have to match all the time, every second of every day, or it doesn't work, the machine breaks. So I, I want to put this in. This is, we have a wind project in the south of here if you drive down to Rosalia. And I didn't, and I'm not gaming the system. This is a kind of a, I said, give me a representative day. So this is the wind. So let's talk this about. You now you can see this. So the wind capacity for the project in, in, is 100 megawatts. So you can see the shape of the wind, of how the wind blows. So what do you think we do with that? How do you, what do you do? Let's talk about that. Because, so, it's great at 1 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the morning or 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm almost at full capacity, but everybody's in bed. Great. The wind's not cooperating with me today. So what do I do? What are we able to do because we're a Vista with hydro? We completely shut off the dams, man. We don't let a drop of water go. We store all that water 
and we just flow that right through. Bang, into the system. Bang, into the system. So, and it's pretty good because it's peaking right when you guys get up in the morning, so we're loving it. This is great. We're loving this. It's almost at full capacity. So then it drops off. The wind starts, quits blowing. Oh my God, then you everybody starts coming home from work. One, two, three, four, five, six. Loads have to match resources. You all come home from work. You want to turn on your air conditioner. It's hot. You want to plug all your stuff in. You want to play video games. You turn on all four TVs. All your kids, you got four kids, they're all in a different video game. Do whatever you want to say. What do you think we do? We got to turn something on. Loads of resources have to match. I don't get to, I don't get to say, well, sucks to be you. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. So what do we do? We turn our dams on. But what happens if it's a bad water year? What happens if I don't have enough water behind my dam? But what happens if I have a maintenance issue with one of those? But what happens if I don't, the load is so great that there's not enough water to serve the load? Which happens. I don't have enough water to serve the load all the time. But I have to turn something on. So this is the piece of the conversation that you as a utility executive got to wrestle with. You want to be 100% clean 100% of the time, but you got to turn something on, and there's no batteries right now. I, I mean, I, you can, maybe you can say, Scott, by 2050, there's going to be batteries that fix this. I hope so. Or there's going to be carbon capture. So when you turn that thermal plant on, it doesn't matter because they're going to capture the carbon. So you don't, and I hope, I, I hope, but it ain't true today. It ain't going to be true five years from now. I promise you. It's not, the technology is not coming that fast. So in the meantime, see, this is the stuff that our brilliant engineers would get wrapped around the axle on. How can you save 100% clean by 2045? What are we going to do? And what we've decided to do is to say, right now, let's do 80. Let's do 85. Let's work on other solutions. But there's another thing that you got to do to be able to fix this. We used to have these large baseload plants. We're going to get rid of all of those, and we're going to build these things called peakers. They're like jet engines. And you can turn them on within like five minutes. They're, they're, they use natural gas, so it does have some carbon footprint. So if I don't have enough water, I can turn on those peakers. And what you're going to see in the country as more base load, coal plants, big gas plants go away, and more of this goes online, something's got to follow the load. The resource has to follow the load. So for a while, until somebody figures it out, you're going to have peakers that have, are going to come on and just like jet engine this thing in, fill in the blank, and as soon as the wind kicks on, or if you have enough battery storage or something, you'll just turn it off. So at some point, and I don't know, I mean, that's the point is when you're in this thing is 100% clean, 90% of the time okay? Is 100% clean 80% of the time okay? When you think about reliability and affordability too, or does it have to be 100% clean 100% of the time? And that's your reality. So if you say it has to be, it has to be 100% clean 100% of the time, what are you going to do? So just one, and again, this is just il illustrative. And this, this assumes today's technology. Again, I'm doing this in the term of 2020. I'm not doing this in 2045. So you can say, Scott, there's going to be batteries by 2045. Relax. We got this. Or you can say, by 2045, they'll have carbon capture figured out. Relax. We got this. But this is as if 
I can't relax because we don't got it. That's what this, this is. So this is just a data point. So this is the amount of 2018 renewables installed across six states in the United States, and that's the land it's taking up. Not too bad. About one and a half to seven and a half times the area of Portland and Seattle. That's what it's currently is. So let's say the six state region wants to have 80%. That's not just a VISTA, all the utilities, the six states. We want to build renewables by 2050, 80% reduction in greenhouse gases, basically increasing renewables up to about 80%. So that's the land it's going to take, roughly, to build the windmills and the solar panels that we've got to be able to figure out to site this stuff. Not bad, 8 to 37 times the area of Portland and Seattle. Again, I'm not, we're not saying it's all going to go in Oregon. But what we're doing is we're putting it close to the load centers. Look, at, there's a lot of wind in Montana. So you could say, well, put all this here. Who cares about all that land in Montana? So we can move it around. The point is it's just the land. It's just a, it's illustrative. But what, so let's say, though, Scott, 100%, 100% of the time, What? How did it go from this? Two utility guys are fudging the numbers. No, we're not. Remember the wind? It was 100, and then it was down to zero, then it was 10, then it was 30, and then it was zero. So in order to have enough renewables 100% of the time, you have to build five times the amount you need so that you got something that will blow. When the wind's only, when you only have, when you, I have 100 megawatts. Let's go backward. I have 100. But right now it's only giving me 50. I have to have enough windmills to fill in the other 50, don't I? So I, I can't just build 100. I got to build 300 to get 100. I get a bill 400 to get 100. And when I have too much, I'll shut other stuff off. But there's times when five times isn't going to matter. I can have 100 times. When the wind ain't blowing, the wind ain't blowing. Unless we all go out there and go. So that's what the, the issue is around that. So, do you accept peakers or not? To turn on or do you build this? You don't get a pass. You don't get to say that's not my problem. You get to be Scott, you're the Avista CEO. You have to decide what you're going to do. You're Zag, you can figure it out. You know, one of the cool things that people also think about corporations, that we're a corporation, you're a Vista, you're this big company, you're completely traded. You know, most of our engineers are, almost all of them are Zags, Cougars, Vandals, Eagles, or Huskies. So people that went to school here are trying to figure this out, or your next-door neighbor. So this isn't some esoteric, theoretical, publicly traded, publicly traded corporation that doesn't give a shit about you. This is people that went to your university that work at our company that are trying to figure this out. Really good people. So again, as you get into this conversation, I would just encourage you to think about that, is that we do want to figure it out. But we're trying to do it in a broader context. So there are some things, again, in, we know that Spokane has some of the poorest we, we, we are not as wealthy as Seattle and Portland. The third legislative district where the Gonzaga is is the poorest legislative district in the state of Washington. Affordability matters in the Logan neighborhood. So no matter what we do, I got to keep that top of mind. So what are some things that we're doing if I can't bank on technology? I hope it comes. So what have we done? We've created a bunch of clean energy companies like ITRON which has created the best smart meter in the world right now that we're putting them on. 
We, we started that company, as we, we, we spun it off. ECOVA, which is an energy sustainability solutions-based company that helps multi-site companies and other companies use energy and sustainability wisely to reduce their energy spend and lower their carbon footprint. We started that company. They're still here. Their company is twice as large as their Vista now. Rely on. We started a fuel cell company for backup power. So we're not only outside of the utility, we're trying to create new clean energy businesses that will help solve these problems. That's part of what our responsibility is. What else have we done? We're doing smart, we had the first smart city in America in Pullman in 2013. We put in smart meters and started to do that distribution automation thing I was talking to you about. We have, we have, we, we Avista started the smart city in Urban Nova in Spokane that just won an award last year as the best smart city in America. Trying to figure out ways to lower, use the grid for other applications other than electricity to help lower carbon footprint. We, we built a community solar project. We had the, actually, we built the largest battery storage project in North America in Pullman at Schweitzer Engineering in 2016. Unfortunately, that battery failed this year. It broke. It didn't work. It was only for one megawatt. Remember, the wind was 100? So this project's battery was for one megawatt, and it was about the size of a small, single wide mobile home. So you want to see what technology is for grid level storage. One megawatt was a single wide mobile home. Now there's other stuff happening. And again, I'm not dissing batteries, because they got to work. And I'm thinking they are. But it ain't there for the grid yet. We have, we, we did some, we won an award as the most innovative electric vehicle charging pilot in the, in the country. And then we're doing some stuff in the eco district across the way. You might have seen our commercials, but it's true. We're building the most sustainable, energy efficient building in North America. I'm not kidding you. It is the most sustainable and energy efficient building in North America when it's done next year. It's made out of cross laminated timber. We've, we've, we've made it the smartest building in North America. We have so many sensors in this thing. You're going to be able to machine learn this building so it can study what's happening inside the building. We're hooking it up to a microgrid that isn't just for the building, but it's for the block. It's the first microgrid that's going to serve multiple buildings in North America. And we did it without government subsidies. We got, we got a little bit of a grant, but we wanted to build this building so somebody would actually rent it. What good does it do to build the most sustainable, energy efficient building in, in North America if it's so expensive people can't move in? So we wanted to prove that we could do this and do it in a way that somebody would actually pay the rent. So fortunately, Eastern's going to pay the rent. They're going to move in all of their electrical engineers, all of their um, uh, computer scientists, and all of their um, visual design students. About 1,500 students are going to move in there. We're moving all of our R&D in there. The Kinstry's moving in there. We're also going to set up a laboratory so that students, engineering and, and IT students can work with our our R&D folks to create new things for energy on the grid. <clears throat> We're in the solar. I told you we have two of the largest solar projects, the community solar and the, and the solar select. But did you know, because usually people say that utilities don't want solar panels. Today, if you wanted solar panels, we actually have a thing online where you can go GPS it. We can show you how much sun your, your roof gets. We can tell you if it's cost effective to put so solar panels on your house, and we'll help you do it if you want to do that, even though it's taken away our load. Or if you want to be, if you want to say, you know what, I want to buy renewable energy credits to offset my own carbon footprint because of Vista, you're only 60% renewable, you could do that. Surprising, a lot of people don't want to pay for those renewable energy credits, but if you really cared and you really wanted to do it, we have this bucket block program that's been online for 20 years. If you want to take a social responsibility stand and do that while I try to catch up to you, you can do that. And then finally, when we did the distribution automation piece, the smart meter is going to be really cool because that's going to be able to give you real-time information. We can push information to you because one of the ways that we're really going to solve this climate change thing is through energy efficiency. 
you got to, the houses have to use less, buildings have to use less, we have to use less. And we've got to figure out ways to use if energy more efficiently and you need more data. So smart meters are like the key to helping us do that. So I'm running out of juice on my voice. We'll continue to do new technology. We're hoping that declining costs for clean energy continue. Four legs of the stool. We need help from our regulators so we pay for all this. Rates will change, but we're trying to do it at about inflation. Think about customers, communities, employees, and shareholders. You don't get a pass. They're your four legs of the stool. You've got to be reliable. You've got to be affordable. And I'm retired, so there is a job open at Avista if you guys want to <laughs> apply. So I'm going to stop there. How'd I do, Brian? I went a little long. I'm okay. sorry. Okay. So that's it. Questions? <laughs> See, it's easy. Thank you. <laughs> Piece of cake. Yes. You know, if I can I can speak for the electric I can speak for the electric industry, even not just the Vista, but even some of those biggest polluters that you see. The the utility I can say this because I'm in Edison Electric Institute, all the utilities have moved on. They recognize that it's their responsibility to move. They they just people are going to move at different paces because if you are a completely fossil fuel utility, it is a huge issue to try to figure this out and how to do it affordably. But they are committed to do it. People, we've shut down more coal plants, even though Trump is saying, you know, more coal. Utilities are willingly shutting down coal plants. The state of Washington has a coal plant in Centralia. It's closing next year. You saw that the first two units of coal strip, one and two, in, in, is, are going to close. Three and four are going to stay open. But I want to talk about that for a minute. It's easy to say coals, close the coal plant. Close the mine. The people, I know, I've been to Coal Strip a bunch. Coal Strip is a small little community of about 10,000 people. If you, own a, if you own a home in Coal Strip, Montana, and you worked at the, at the plant, and that plant closes, and your life savings are in the equity in your home, How's that going to make you feel if you were in Coal Strip, Montana, and you have the utility guy say, we're going to shut the plant down? It's a reality of what it kills me. I, I, we need to do it, but it also is something that is gut-wrenching. When you go to Coal Strip, and I see the, the men and women that work in that, mill, uh, that place, and, they've, and they have supplied energy to the Northwest for 40 years before we knew what carbon was, and maybe you like coal, maybe you didn't. And Coal Strip, you know what? is the second cheapest resource we have in our resource mix. It's, it's not as cheap as hydro, but it's cheaper than wind and solar. So when we shut it down, it's, it's affordable, but the people in Coal Strip are going to be impacted. Human beings, moms and dads. And as a society, we got to figure that out. And that's part of this affordability issue. How much do you subsidize? How much do you jump in? If you're an elected official in Montana, you see why they fight that. It's not that they're bad people, but if you have a family of four come to the Capitol and say, if you shut the coal plant down, not only am I losing my job, but I'm losing my life saving. It's a, it's a hard issue. I'm not saying you don't do it. I'm just saying it's hard. And it's easy to sit on the sidelines and just say do it, but I've, I'm, I, I have had to go to the plant and talk to employees about it. That is not a great conversation to have. Yes. At this point, no. And one of the reasons, a couple of reasons, nuclear plants, when they're built, they're massive. The amount of electricity that comes out of, out of a nuclear plant would more, has, is more than we need. It would probably, one nuclear plant would be an Avista and an Idaho Power maybe even more than that. 
And it's so expensive to build those big nuclear plants now. I mean, they cost billions of dollars. So unless technology comes to build them smaller, I would say nuclear doesn't have a long opportunity because it's too expensive. The regulations as they should be are very onerous to build big nuclear plants. But that's not to say that the people that run them now, if you notice, I mean, I don't want to jinx Exelon, but they've never had an accident. They've had them for 40 years. But the word nuclear scares every, I mean, it should, but it, they, they work, they have great safety records. But that's one of the things that if somebody figures that out as a utility, would we do it? We'd have a lot of solar system users. Yes. Yes. It is. Right. And For us, we've saved about two power plants in energy efficiency since 1980. So what we do right now is we have lots of incentives that you might be seeing. We try to push energy efficiency messages and rewards and carrots to people all the time. What we're going to try to do is with our smart meters then actually start pushing more information to you. When The way you get your electric bill today, craziest darn thing ever. You use electricity for the month of September. We send you a bill for it in the middle of October. By the middle of October, you can't remember what you did in September. You don't know why your bill was high or low. So with this meter, we can actually, then you can say, you know what, Scott, I want to spend $100 a month on electricity. And I want you to tell me if I'm going to go over that. So we can look, and you're 10 days into this, and you've already spent $70. I can now send you a text and say, red alert, I don't know what you're doing, but you're doing something that, you know, and again, that's part of the personal accountability. It's not my fault you used $70. You didn't turn off the TVs. You got your air conditioning cranked to 65. I don't know what you're doing, but you're using it. And that's part of the transition that has to happen where often you get your utility bill, and it's our fault, it's 45 days after you've used it. You don't remember what you've done. Trust me, when all you guys go home for Christmas and you take five hot showers a day, you forget to close the door, you leave every light on the house. When you leave and your mom and dad get your electric bill, it's going to be high. And they're going to look at it and go, how is it so high? And then they're going to know, oh, yeah, that's right. My daughter or my son or all their friends came home for Christmas. We get that a lot. Yes. Yeah. Sure. So probably one of the things that is there, we, we do more, um, have more cybersecurity infrastructure built into the grid than I think people really realize. We have everything from, <coughs> excuse me, people, we hire people to hack us. We were the first utility in the country that actually had the, 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 the Washington National Guard, uh, a cyber force. I guess I can say that. And we asked them to attack us like we were the bad guys and they were going to try to get us to see if they could get in. Um, we, we, also look for avenues about ways to how you can get in. You know, it isn't just getting into the power side. You can get into the billing side. What are the different little hidey holes? We have aggressive trading on fishing even. We fake fish. And if you screw up and hit the button, we don't punish you, but we, we like to say, oops. And if you, if you, Oops, two or three times we try to then have an attitude adjustment a little bit on fishing. <coughs> Struck the positive way. So, no, in every utility, and there's a national over, you know, we, we talk in our Homeland Security, we get um, information when, uh, when people are, are attacking us, but we're attacked 
tens of thousands of times a day. And we watch it, and fortunately nobody's ever gotten in, but every utility has that. And the hardest one is, frankly, it's not the guy in the basement eating pizza and drinking Coke or trying to hack. It's, it's nation states that really, that's part, of, that's part of just warfare today, because what do we just say about the economy? Just think of if the, if the grid goes out, what's going to happen? It's just going to be chaos. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an aggressive warfare tool for every country to focus on grids and figure out how you take them out. You know, some of it, I think, it's easy for the United States to take it in terms of let's get 100% green. But if you're a developing country that has literally no middle class, and you know the way to get the middle class is to have a robust electric grid, because it is. You're not going to have a, a developed country unless you have a robust electric grid. So do we deny them the opportunity for that grid? Um, I'm not saying, I don't know what the answer is, but that's part of it, is that as other countries try to get themselves to be like America, one of the ways they do that is have great infrastructure. So India, China, and even other countries are doing that. So that's part of the conversation that happens. Well, it's easy for you to say that, America. But we want to be like you from that perspective. So you're just trying to, you know, I, I don't have a crystal ball on that. We, what we have did internally is, that's part of the conversation too. It's like, well, why bother doing it? It's not going to move the dial. If China and India don't do it, who cares? It's not going to matter. So we just decided to say is, you know what? I can't control, what can I control? What's the right thing to do? What's our values? How do we how do we do it? Lead by example. I'm not giving you a great answer, but I don't really have an answer how the world's gonna come together to figure it out. All I know is that in your hometown, we're just gonna do it as best we can. Keep in mind those three areas. And if it gets too expensive, we'll have to have more conversations. We have lots of energy efficiency, and I'm not sure I know which one that is. I'm looking at that now. Oh, well, we do a lot of, if you build from an energy efficiency perspective and meet LEED goals and all those types of things, we have lots of incentives that help building owners pay for some of that. that work. And if you, Maureen can get your name, and if you're interested, we can get back to you and make sure that you'll have more energy efficiency program information than you'll probably ever want. Any, anything else I can answer for you? Yeah. Yes, we have. And there's none in the region. There is one developer in Montana that has looked at it, and we're interested. Pump storage was always too expensive. What pump storage really is, is that think about water. You run it through the dam, it goes down to the bottom, and then you pump the water back up, and then you just do it again over and over, you just recycle the water. So you gotta be able to make sure it pays for itself because the pump costs money to pump it up the hill to have it go back down. But because of peaking and you know being able to, that intermittent electricity it's so important to be able to turn something on, it becomes more cost effective as more baseload plants, coal and, and natural gas big plants that run all the time go away and wind and solar come on and you need that peaker, yes, then pump storage makes sense. There just isn't any 
That's not to say somebody might not develop them. Thank you. We, well, what we're doing is, I don't know if you saw that we, we planted in the last five years about 50,000 trees. We just reforested um, about 2,500 trees just last weekend. We had volunteers from the Lands Council. So what we've done is to do it locally. So a big piece of our environmental footprint is to do trees. Oh, hi, John. It's a huge problem. It's so the meter now, it also, you know, used to you be able to, the meter is smart enough, machine learning is smart enough, and artificial intelligence is smart enough now because the meters have more computing than a good smartphone in them. That it, so this is big brother stuff, and you have to decide. No, this some people freak out about this. So, but I'll give you the secret. We can actually then watch your loads, so we don't. You don't need to have them separately wired. We can tell the smart meter can tell. Now that was my wife that did that too. Is that awesome? <laughs> Thanks, honey. Oh, okay. Hey, hey. Yeah. So the meter can actually doesn't need to be special. It can tell the by the attribute of the motor or the appliance. It has its own unique wave. So we can tell that's you got three refrigerators going. One of your refrigerators is broken and it's kind of not working good. I mean, it's going to be that kind of stuff that will be able to happen for you, and we can start giving you that real time data. Some people are very offended by that. They, yeah, so you know, we're, we're, we're in its, its infancy, but Joe, over the next three to five years, you will see us. It's going to be pretty rudimentary. You sign on, you can see in real time what's going on, but we're designing apps that will allow us to do all of those kind of things for you. Before we let your uh, voice wrap, rest your voice. Uh, I want to ask uh, one final question. Uh, one of the things we've done with the Aram Lecture over time is to shift it towards having practitioners, uh, is the, the label that we use, give the lecture so that our students have access to um, what it's like in a particular business setting or in a particular industry to have to try to navigate the ethical landscape, to do what's right, to be a mission-driven organization, given all the other sort of empirical contingencies that come to bear on that. So we appreciate you doing that for us. Uh, you've asked the students to imagine that they were the CEO of Avista. And of course, we all imagine that there'll be CEO, CEOs of organizations at some point. If you're a political science major, you can be a CEO. Of there you go, there you right? Um, so uh, my question to you is this. You have experience with the educational mission of Gonzaga, uh, both as a student and as a trustee. What would you tell our students to take away from their education here that could serve them well if they found themselves in your shoes? Don't underestimate the value of, of the core. I've taken philosophy, English, religion, because the critical thinking skills it takes, you heard all of this. There's no, there's no right answer to this stuff. What differentiates people and organizations are their ability to think creatively, to think outside the box, to be able to problem solve, to not get bogged down in black and white, but be comfortable in ambiguity. 
And your education here is that. You, you're having a great business education, one of the best you'll get. Then you got to go to that, why am I going to this stupid? Because you're reading stuff that's challenging you that there's no real right answer to and it's forcing you. So the one thing you, I hope you take away from, and I can tell you that Gonzaga students are different than other people we hire at our company. The woman that runs our um, energy delivery on our engineering, Heather Rosenfeder, right? Heather's our senior vice president that runs all of our operations as well as her engineering is the Gonzaga engineer. She's 42 years old. She's one of the most brilliant technical engineers I've ever met. She's also one of the best critical thinkers I've ever met. And she's got remarkable leadership skills. And that's what it takes to be successful. The other thing I would really challenge you to do as students, when you go start looking for jobs, I don't know how many times I get people just so wrapped around the axle on the what. And I've seen after 40 years, people are, you know why people hate their job? It's never the what, rarely. It's the culture. It's the values. It's the leadership. It's the human interaction of what happens at that company that drives people away. Rarely is it, I, it sucks for what the what is. So as you go look, discern. I, maybe you can't discern, you just be lucky to get a job, like I did when I got hired at Washington Water Power out of college in 1981 as a temporary energy auditor. I just was happy to get a job. But discern about that. And at, talk to people that have gone through it, they will tell you, looking at, where's Perry? Perry's the CEO of Hot Start in Spokane voted one of the best companies to work for in the state of Washington. And he has very technical jobs, but I will tell you that the people there are there not because of their what, they're there because of the values and the culture of Hot Start. And they're motivated to be there about the mission. And they get to use their technical skills while they're at it. Right? That's true. Thank you. Uh, oh. Some All right. Woohoo! No, no, I know. That's great. But now you're good. Uh, yeah, that's so awesome. Thank you, guys. Join me and thank you. Uh, thank you.